Desiccation cover crops. If we're talking about cover crops that are this big, that's easy, right? If you're trying to get corn planted in April and cover crops, you don't have to worry about it. But let's say, though, instead, we want to build a lot of soil health. We want to grow a lot of biomass, a lot like Kerry was talking about. And we could do that ahead of soybeans easily because soybeans really, really, probably like mid May before you really start planting a lot of soybeans. You know, Bill Weebo would probably tell you, I think the best soybean yields are late May. So let's think about that. But also, Newell mentioned, well, he read that thing from 21 years ago about this cover crop meeting. What came out of that? Nothing. Did we? We didn't do anything, did we? Because I was working with cover crops 20 plus years ago. We quit because nobody cared. And all of a sudden, it's great that people have came back to this. So, but the, but the organic folks continued to do it. And I started going to some organic meetings because I was interested in that. I kept seeing this. That's not good. We quit using breaking plow in 1975. We took a breaking, we, we took a, a cutting torch to it. No more. But the folks keep using them. So we want to say, no, we don't want to do that. So we want to go into more to no-till with this. And as Carrie mentioned, we have the, the uh, roller crimper is one of the best ways to get the cover crop down and then you can plant right into it. This looks great. That's a great idea. But guess what? You're planting in the mulch this big. My dad threw me on a planter when I was 10 years old. For 42 years, I've been planting crops. I thought I was pretty good at this. That looks pretty, but guess where all the seed is? Almost on top of the ground. Now, if you get a nice rainfall, you, you, about, you might be okay. But I think Bill Weebo was said that all your roots are on top of the ground and, and you're going to fall over. So even though that looks good, that really didn't work very good. Now, another, oh, that, so this is what it looks like then. As you can see, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of biomass there. And what Kerry was talking about, planting two different directions, the problem is, yeah, it'll, it'll help control weeds, but then you've got these thinner areas here and that's where you get some weeds popping through. Isn't that right, Carrie? That's what happens. So it works pretty good for that, but not perfectly. And she also mentioned flail chopping. Now, 20 plus years ago, this is how we were doing it. I flail chopped it, no tooled right into it. This was Harry Betch I was using for the most part. It worked really good. And you can see it right there. It chops it up really good. It's usually a little flatter. Oh, there's Amy. I didn't see her before. It, it, and then you can plant right into it, and it does a great job. And people told me you couldn't do that because it moves. Well, I did it. I thought it worked pretty good. Until Charlie Ellis said something about hairpinning. I didn't, I didn't know what hairpinning was until he pointed it out to me, but it's, it's this right here. You know, Carrie talked about it, is when you push the dry matter in there with it, you don't get good seed to soil contact, and it doesn't come up very good. Well, can you just overplant? <laughs> no, because <laughs> seed costs too much. So this is what hairpinning is. So this is where it's a good, nice comparison here, where we compared, where we fell, chopped it, and rolled. This is the day that we did it and planted it. Looks pretty good. Came back five days later. The flail chopping, it's still dead. I like that. That's why I used it 25 years ago. But right here, the rolled is still alive. Now, easy for a person conventional. Throw a little glyphosate on it. It's dead. You keep on going. Carrie got in problems with this because it was dead. And this was, this was 2012, and guess what happened to all my soil moisture? It kept sucking it out. That was the problem. They had a lot of bees on it. If you're the insect folks, man, this thing was full of bees. So what are we going to do? Well, it's what Carrie was alluding to also. What if we planted across it? You roll it this way, you plant it this way, everything's happy. You do it like this, every 30-inch rows, you cut it, it's going to die. I tried that this year. I got very frustrated. because I still couldn't get the seed in the ground. It still would want to ride up on there. Because of this right here, that dry matter, there's so much dry matter there, I couldn't get it in there. And I've been doing this for 42 years. It's about, it's about time to quit, I think. Maybe I should retire. What am I going to do? Because look at that. You know, yeah, the seed's there, but it's not getting good seed and soil contact. If we don't get a rain, We've just wasted our time. 
we got some problems here. All right. I was always taught, where's it? Where's Ag Engineers at, Kent and all you other guys? You all kept telling us, well, maybe I wasn't paying attention to John and them, that I thought you got to have a, a, a culture to open up. I thought if you, didn't have a, if you didn't have a culture, you didn't have a no-till planner. I thought that was the basis of everything. I know you're shaking your head now, but the, did you know that 20 years ago? <laughs> no. Did I know it one year ago? No. <laughs> and I really didn't pay attention to the, to the press wheels in the back. I thought whatever came with the planner was good enough for me. Now, look at Matt back there smirking. He said, I figured this out a long time ago. So, what did we do? Let's take this off. Now, as, now for you that, that don't understand this, let's take an example. Jessica, stand up. I'm going to point something. Would you all rather have her in high heels step on your foot or me in my size 12 boots? Whoa, no, you missed a point. No, really. Would you rather have her step on you in high heels or me in boots? Me in boots, wouldn't you? Because that weight is spread over a lot, even though I probably weigh 20 or 30 pounds more, <laughs> plus 100. <laughs> it's, the weight spreads over, and that happens the same way with here, because when we go back, well, I can't see. Yeah, you can. Right here, you've got the weight of that planter here and on those double disc openers. It's spread out. Now, I don't know how much pressure is. How much pressure is exerted down on one of those? I have no idea. Charlie, Kent, somebody, should, surely you learned that sometime or another. 250 pounds. So now it's 125 on each. But if I take that coulter off, boom. I've got all 250 on the one point. And, you've, and if you've got good, sharp double disc openers, it'll bust right through it. I didn't believe it till last May 15th when we had a workshop on it. We did it with and without coulters, and I was shocked. Also, Charlie and Jim Crawford and the rest of them said, man, you got to change your closing wheels. What's wrong with what, what came with it? You need to spend $100 an acre, I mean $100 a row and do something different. Cast iron ones or ones with uh, spikes on it and all this stuff. And I said, okay, let's, let's, see, let's, let's see what we got. So we got our planter with six different types of closing wheels. And Carrie, she saw it one time and went and converted her planter to all the spike ones because the spike ones are what work the best. Any kind of spike on it, it got the seed to soil contact really good. So good, in fact... Last August night, I decided I wanted to plant some sweet corn. I never had changed the planter from these six different ones. I was planting sweet corn. It was too wet. Believe it or not, it was too wet. I gummed it up. The easiest way to fix that, I thought, was put it on the gravel and plant it out that way. Did you know that these right here, like she's got right there that I borrowed off, off hers, planted into gravel? It put that corn an inch and a half deep in gravel parking lot. <laughs> it did. The rest of it was on top of the ground. It's easy to count, you know, my 24,600 seeds per acre. I had to scratch in the ground to get that one. That was pretty neat. So, we could do that. But somebody mentioned, actually, I, I think, did, did, did a student suggest this, Carrie, planting into the crop, standing? She said, why don't you just plant into it standing? Like this. So, we did that. We compared where we had to change the coulters, change all that stuff, to planting directly into the planter, I mean, planting directly in, into the cover crop. And this is about 5,500 pounds per acre on May 15th. We planted directly into it, and guess what? It worked a lot better. Because think about it, we don't have this much residue to go through anymore. We have just normal residue. And, you know, in this day of technology, you don't have to have markers anymore. You've got, you've got, uh, what do you call that? Well, I know that, but, yeah, wherever that is. All those, numbers, all those letters mess me up. But we got all that stuff. We don't have to, it makes, it makes our job a lot easier. And our result, soybeans, you know, we were having so much fun. I ruined all my research because we were having so much fun doing things. I couldn't get replicated data. But I had some, some corn data 
and I planted 32,000, and when we did it standing up, it, made, it had 20, this is over, all 12 treatments, everything that we had, 27,000 and a half versus 25,000 and a half. So about 2,000 more. And that would make a difference on corn yield. And some of our treatments, like in the heavy cereal rye, it was even bigger difference than this. Okay, just to prove that we were ahead of the game, if you can see this, this date, 1990. We were doing no-till cover crops in 1990, and nobody cared. This was planting right into hairy vet that we had mowed. It worked pretty good. We could get about 75 to 100 pounds of N consistently off that, all the N that we, that we wanted to for, for grain sorghum. Okay, what if I don't want to go through all of that? What if I want something simple? What if I want to be like, where's Rich Horman? Like Rich says, we don't want to slow down in the, in the I'm, I'm picking on people. We don't want to slow down in the spring. Farmers do not want to be messed with April 1. I want to plant corn. Let's use this. Let's use this to plant our cover crop and also utilize it when we can uh, plant our next crop. So it's a 15-inch row planter. So this is what, okay, we had that Soil Health Expo last August 8th and 9th. Had Steve Groth here. I, I learned something. 11 days later, I was planting this. I don't mess around, folks. I don't have to, you don't have to get funded either at first. We'll get that later. <laughs> well, by golly, you got to do it, don't you? Sometimes you got to go. That's why I did. So what we did, we got tillage radish at two pounds per acre on 30-inch centers, and then the other ones, we either have cereal rye, oats, winter oats, spring oats, or triticale. Never planted triticale before. Doing this because Steve Groth has showed this in Pennsylvania, and what we're going to do, well, here it is right before, it's about November. There's a date on there or something. No, it's not. It's about November. You can see it. It's starting to get hurt already by the cold weather. Then what we're going to do, I can't wait to do this. Woo. We're gonna, it's going to winter kill like this, and we're going to come in. We can either plant it when it looks like this, probably what? End of April, 1st of May, I don't know when it'll be, just depending on how the spring goes. Or we can plant it early like this, but we can go in and we can plant that corn right on top of those tillage radishes. And they said that, that, that you think, my God, I got holes in the ground two inches wide. So the, it, it, it doesn't make a difference. And then we should get all those nice benefits that, that Mike Palmer was talking about and everybody else about rooting depth and all those good things. So that's one of the things that we're doing. Just to give you some data, this year we got seven more bushels per acre following our cover crop than our, than our controls. We got some more things there, but Kevin Bradley says you are not a weed scientist, so keep your mouth shut. And we had a little bit bigger study where we looked at different cover crops and, and put soybeans into them. And really, you know, we had a great corn year, but man, our soybeans fell off the edge at the very end of the summer. But, but, with, but with cereal rye, we got another seven bushel per acre because all that, all that mat was there what moisture we got, this is just me figuring on this, it conserved the moisture, and that's what helped our soybeans right there. Corn, we had a lot better corn year. I made this red so Weebold couldn't see it, and he left. He's colorblind, by the way. We had 175 bushel corn. We had almost a 24 bushel increase following Harry Vetch. Five minutes, I'm almost done. And then uh, when, we, when we had cereal rye, no results. None. Did I put that picture behind it? No, I didn't. But you would have thought we would have because the, the, uh, the cereal rye the, looked a lot better, the, the, the crop after that. But I think the lelopathy or something is starting to mess with us, and that's why I'm starting to be convinced that we need to look at triticale a little bit more. But we did get some good results this past year. And even though this was probably the – I've been off and on for 25 years working with cover crops, I think this was the worst spring we ever had as far as legumes go. Cold, wet spring, they did not want to grow off. So that's probably why we didn't see as big of results that we normally see sometimes with that. Any questions? This is like church. Come on, people. <laughs> Nadia. Can you say something about what you have done with natives? 
She wants me to talk about what we've done with natives in what, in what way? Okay, well, what Nani's talking about using, we're, we're wanting to use, um, incorporate natives as cover crops, and the problem with natives, though, is so many of them are perennials. There, there are a few annuals, like, like partridge peas and what have you, but what we would like to do, we, we like to use cover crops, you know, our typical cover crops, use those for, for uh, insects, for wildlife, but also use our natives as a reservoir for those times when our cover crops aren't, aren't blooming. You know, that 30 foot along our edge of our field that, that makes nothing? Have that with our natives in it, and that is like a reservoir or a, a refuge, I should say, for our beneficial insects. But we also get the benefit in the spring and fall from our, from our other ones. Is that what you're talking about? You just tell me, I'll repeat it. Okay, okay, she's talking about maybe using uh, native cover crops for perennial crops. You know, what I think what she's referring to is I was talking to her about permaculture. With Dr. Shabu, we, we, they were talking about permaculture. And there we can incorporate some more native crops to get for our insects, for lots and lots of uh, uh, topics that way. So there is a lot of potential, and we've got to talk because we've just scratched the surface of this. Anything else? Tim? Uh, on the oil seed, <laughs> where are you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. On on the corn, you're going to come back and follow the oil seed radish uh -huh. with. Uh, what are you going to do for weed control on that annual ryegrass, or what are your options oh, going to be? That's a good point. Be because what one thing I'm wondering about is you could do Roundup Ready corn, you know, so you've got yes. different options to play with. He went. Well, y'all heard his question on that oil seed radish. I'm glad you said that because I mentioned I said the T word. Well, we're going to, that's going to be conventional, so yes, we will come back with glyphosate or something like that to kill the, the uh, cereal rye or, or the, or the chili kale. What do you plant after you plant? I was going to split it. He wanted to know if I'm going to put the herbicide on or after. I was going to split it. Some was going to be the day of, and I might wait a week or so. Wait just a minute. you got to get the official microphone. Tim, have you tried tillage radish in the wheat and the, you, you know, we've been talking about intercropping with the cover crops mm -hmm. inside of our conventional crops and the things that I see that maybe wheat has a pretty good benefit. Have you done anything with that out at the farm yet? Putting, putting uh, tillage radish with, the, with, our, with our wheat? Yeah. No, we have. I know Steve Groff, they have done it by accident once. And they've done it again, and they've actually got some, some yield boost out of it. You know, this fall got so busy. I had good intentions of doing that. But it would be very, very good to look at, though. But what we have looked at, though, is what Kerry pointed out. After wheat harvest, we have a tremendous possibility to put it in, in some of these cover crops. There is a window of opportunity that we have not taken advantage of. For wildlife, for soil building, soil health, we can do a lot after wheat harvest. Thank you.